So let us enjoy our breathing with the three sounds of the bell. Um, enjoy this very present moment. Good morning, dear Thai, dear respected uh, brothers and sisters, dear Sangha. Today is uh, May 13th, the year 2018. We are at the Blue Cliff Monastery. And this is probably my last talk here. <laughs> um, happy Mother's Day to everyone, uh, especially to our mothers and um, our grandmothers and our Sumer, <laughs> the Dhamma teachers who are also mothers for their younger brothers and sisters, and Sujia, which is the brothers um, who are the like fatherly um, figure for the young brothers. So. Um, Today is a very beautiful day. I hear that um, from the florists and from the orchid um, farms, they say that today is the best day for flowers to bloom. So it's, uh, we can celebrate kind of like the abundance of spring and also abundance of love and um, Peace from Mother. Today I have with me uh, two flowers. <laughs> it represents uh, our parents. They represent our parents, our father and our mother. Um, I'll share about this later. So uh, first of all, I'd like to um, ask uh, our friends here, what do you do on Mother's Day, usually? Can you just raise your hand and then share briefly? Yes? Plant flowers. Plant flowers, okay. Anybody else? Come on, you all celebrate Mother's Day. <laughs> yes. We call mothers. We call mothers, yeah. You can speak loudly, yes. Um, we're bringing our mom here as a treat. Aww, you're bringing your mom here for Mother's Day. Wonderful. Could you? Yeah, usually I spend it with my children and grandchild and other and extended family of their other mothers. And I think with my own mother and uh, take a picture of her. Hmm. 
Thank you. Bring your children and your, your grandchildren together and celebrate and have your mother's picture. That's wonderful. Usually my husband and children reverse things for the day and take care of me on the line. And then we spend time together with my sister and my mom today. My mother and I are here together for the first time. Oh, wow. That's so wonderful. Your mother's here. Yes. And your husband let you take the day off. Which is wonderful. <laughs> okay, that's wonderful. I think of my mother who said prayers. She's no longer with us in this world. You think of your mother in prayers. That's wonderful. Yeah, so actually, in um, the old uh, Christian I think, celebration, you have a Mother's Day where, you know, your family just let, if you're a mother, uh, take off for the day and not do any chores. <laughs> that was the traditional. And um, the history of um, Mother's Day in USA is actually um, from there and also from uh, Anna Jarvis, who, um, after her mother passed away, she held a Memorial Day for her mother at uh, St. Andrew Methodist Church, Church in um, Grafton, West Virginia, which is very close to here. That was in um, 1905. And then after that, she came paying in order to make this holiday a um, national holiday. And after um, after that, it became an official holiday in 1914. But afterwards, you know what happened with the advertisement and everything, so it became very commercialized. So she regret putting it on the calendar, and she tried to take it back. But there's no way she can take it back. So, well, I'm happy that it still exists for us to celebrate Mother's Day. And in Thailand, the, at Thai, we have mom here who's from Thailand. Um, Mother's Day is celebrated on the same day as U.S., but later on they um, commemorate the queen who uh, does a lot for her country. So they use her birthday. Um, so it's in August 12th <laughs> instead. And there they, um, they're offering alms to the monastic. And then the children will kneel down and then offer the, their mothers the garland of jasmine flowers and, um, and get their blessing. So when I was in Thailand, actually we have that done. It's very beautiful. And um, <clears throat> in Japan, they um, also celebrate Mother's Day. They used to use the, the Empress Kojong's birthday. Um, as a Mother's Day, and after that, in 1949, they decided to also change to American uh, Mother's Day, which is May, that Sunday of May. And um, the children also um, offer red carnations to their mothers, and I think they have the tradition of giving white carnation if uh, one's mother is no longer with them. Um, in, in the Buddhist circle, it's called Ulumbana. I'm going to write this down. Bana, or in Vietnamese we call Vu Lang. And I don't know how to write Chinese, but <laughs> it's called Yu Lang in Chinese. And um, on this day, um, the temples, we have um, 
prayers and chanting for the passing away of, of for the um, other souls who passed away. And uh, this goes back to the history of um, in the Buddha's time when uh, the mother of uh, one of the venerable, his name is Maha Mogalyana. His mother passed away and because in her life she did some um, some bad, they call it bad deeds, so she was, when he um, attained a rashship, he was able to see that his mother is suffering from wherever she is. So, so he asked the Buddha how to help her, and the Buddha say, "Well, if you make um, arms round, if you make offerings to the sangha, and if you pray for her, and then she will be free from whatever realm of suffering that she's in." So that tradition still held on until this day. So um, many temples do uh, offerings and and chanting, and it's also a way to pay gratitude to our parents and our ancestors. Um, and we believe that even everyone who passed away, they could be in at one point our parents in previous life. So we pray for everybody. <laughs> so it's a big uh, ceremony for many uh, Buddhist temples. And this tradition usually held in Vietnam, China, Malaysia, countries who still uh, worship Buddha. Buddha. So, um, but in 1962, our teacher, uh, Venerable, um, Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, he, um, he wrote a book called A Rose for Your Pocket. We do have it here, also in our book, bookstore. Um, he wrote this after his mother passed away. It's when he um, started to realize that, you know, when you can appreciate your mother um, and when you can be present for her, that is the sign of mindfulness. And actually, I think that's when he first discovered mindfulness, is to be fully present. Um, I think before that, Thay suffered a lot when his mother passed away. Um, he did, and he had also some depression himself. But when he started to meditate and start to touch mindfulness, he started to see that his mother is in, in, is in him. And when he had mindfulness, he can touch his mother, and there's no separation. So he wrote this book, um, A Rose for Your Pocket. And in this book, he um, described an incident where he and another venerable, venerable Titting Ang, they went to a bookstore in uh, Japan and one young lady came up to Thai, our teacher, and pinned and asked the other venerable something and then pinned a white carnation on Thai's um, lapel. And he was so shocked because he didn't know what that meant. And he didn't dare to like ask the lady because he couldn't speak Japanese. So he turned to that venerable and said, you know, what is she doing? And so um, the venerable explained to Thai that you know, they have this tradition in Japan for Mother's Day, they would pin a carnation for um, those who still have mother, they would pin a white one and uh, a red one, and those who no longer have their mother, they would pin a white one. So they really liked that tradition, so he brought it back to um, Vietnam, and we start to have this ceremony ceremony called the Rose Ceremony, and it's still happening in many temples of Vietnam now, after 1962. Um, and oftentimes, here when we celebrate uh, the Rose Festival, we read an excerpt from this book. Um, and 
if you have time, you can read more. But um, in in one of his quote in this book is, um, if you love your mother when you come home today, you can sit down next to her and make her pay attention to you. You look deeply into her eyes and say, "Mother, do you know that I love you?" Um, because they felt that often we are too busy, and often our mothers, our mother, uh, is too busy to have time for us. And um, if you just let her put down whatever she's doing and look into her eyes, and that's the sign of mindfulness. You are truly present. It's like um, I am here for you, you know, mother. I'm here for you. And then the mother would put down what she's doing and look into the child's eye and recognize that her child is with her. Um, and they say that um, when you love your mother, you don't have to do anything. You just have to love her. That is enough. Uh, he said that when he was a young boy and um, in his one of his class, the teacher asked him, "If you love your mother, what do you do?" And he said, "Oh, you know, I will um, let me get the excerpts. I must obey her, help her, take care of her when she's old, and pray for her, keeping the ancestral altar when she has disappeared forever behind the mountain." Um, but when they they look back and see that. What she have, what he have to do is, is very um, uh, superficial. He say what he must do is actually just to be present, and just to love her, and that's enough. And I guess when we are present, then we really know what we need to do, <laughs> um, rather than just doing things without knowing what we're doing. So uh, in Buddhism, we mention. We talk about the um, the four gratitudes. So the first gratitude is about gratitude to our parents, because they're the one who um, give birth to us and who nurture us and who educated us. Um, I think mother is the first teacher in our life, right? Yeah. And the second gratitude is uh, gratitude to our teachers who transmitted the knowledge, the teachings, and the practice. Um, if they're your spiritual teachers, and the third gratitude is um, gratitude to our friends who support and guided us on the path, or guided or helped us in difficult moments. Um, and the fourth gratitude is the gratitude to all beings, um, the animals, plants, minerals, um, those who sustain our life and make our life comfortable. And our teacher added the, the bonus gratitude, <laughs> which is um, gratitude to his students. Um, he said that he's very grateful for his students because they also teach him um, many things, love and understanding. So I guess you, those who don't have students, you can also um, have gratitude toward your children because they're also your students in a way who um, make you, um, who taught us to be more loving and more understanding. I think being a mother is a very um, challenging, I have to say, and very uh, brave thing to do. I have watched my, um, my sister raising her child, and it's not very easy. Um, but I also have seen, you know, many mothers who have uh, an easy way of mothering, if you're lucky. <laughs> but uh, what I enjoy too is um, when mother can also be like a friend to their um, children, because that's the best way that we can connect. 
Actually, in my family, uh, we don't call our mother uh, Maya or Ma or <laughs> Maya or whatever that the Vietnamese usually call. Um, I think my parents were um, raised during the French War, so um, most young mothers at that time were uh, inclined to let their child call them Maman like the French way. And so we call, we call our mom Mang. Mang mean Mamang, but for short. And Mang in Vietnamese also mean bamboo. <laughs> so, you know, the children, like my brown sisters and our family, um, sometimes we tease our mother. She asks, like, oh, what do you like to have for lunch? You know, we say, can we have some stir fry bamboo, please? <laughs> And you know, we were just joking about her, but um, I, c I kind of like to call her Mang because it sounds more friendly and um, I don't have to see her just like somebody who is very high above and uh, who only tell me what to do, but really a close friend. So when we, when we use um, the word Mang in our family, it sounds very um, cozy and very close. But of course, all of you have a way to call your mother. I think um, one of our young um, teenager here who lives near the monastery, she called her mother by her, her name, <laughs> which is interesting. But I can see they develop a kind of a sisterly friendship that's kind of beautiful. So anyway, um, is any, if you call your mother by any name, I'm sure, is something you feel close to your heart. And there's a special um, place that you have in your heart. So when we love a mother, um, what's the best thing we can offer to our mother, our parents? So in Buddhism, we have three kinds of gifts or offerings. The first one is the material gift. The second one is the spiritual gift. the gift of non-fear. So, um, as some of us have shared, we uh, offer a mother something, um, cards or flowers, um, food. In some country they make food for their mother. Um, that is a very uh, beautiful way to offer. But um, we can also go to one more step, that is to offer our parents the spiritual gift. Um, the, the gift of the practice the gift of uh, spirituality. Um, usually 
they say that monks and nuns, because we don't, do not make money and we do not have a lot of money, so the best thing we can offer to our parents is the spiritual gift, because you know that um, they needed that more than anything else. Um, of course, for those of us who have brown sisters out there who work, and they can help our parents with the material things already, and um, the monastic can offer that kind of gift, spiritual gift. Mm. And the, which is um, also the practice of mindfulness. How many of you are new here for the first time? Okay. Have you heard about mindfulness? Or have you practiced mindfulness? Not really? Okay. <laughs> Well, we're glad you're here. Um, so, in this monastery, or in this tradition, we practice um, um, a kind of meditation, a Zen meditation called mindfulness. And mindfulness means to be fully present to the here and now, to be present of our body and mind, to be present to our feelings, our perceptions, our state of mind, which is the mental formations, and to our consciousness. Um, when we come back to our in-breath and our breath in the present moment, we can touch what is happening right now inside of us and around us. So mindfulness is to be present, to recognize, to embrace, and to transform whatever is coming up for us. And so when we can do that to ourselves, we can also do that for our loved ones. And that's what Thay meant by when you love your mother, you don't really need to do anything. It means that if we take good care of ourselves and we are very mindful, then we can also be mindful of the other person's presence and take care of them. And uh, the third gift is the gift of non-fear. It means that um, fear from what? <laughs> we have to say fear from what? Um, I think fear from no birth, no death is the greatest fear that all of us have in our life. Uh, we fear of illness, we fear of dying, we fear of losing our loved ones. So to be able to recognize those fears and to um, accept them, um, we can offer that gift to other people. Our teacher is by far one of the most beautiful example of non-fear. Um, a few years ago, about Four years ago, when our teacher was in um, was having a stroke, and he was um, kind of like in a coma. But we can f we can see that when I came to the hospital with other monastics, we can see that um, he's so mindful, even if he's in a coma, he's still breathing mindfully in and out very deeply, and uh, he's trying to fight for his life, but with a lot of um, ease. And the doctors say that he doesn't need um, the oxygen, uh, you know, what you call that thing? Huh? Huh? The ventilator. So um, he doesn't need a ventilator. He can just breathe on his own. And it's very rare for a um, stroke patient to not needing that, especially in his age, when he's already over um, 80 or near 90. And he breathing is even deeper than most of us. <laughs> um, the doctors say that he has the very high um, rank of oxygen. And you can tell that, you know, when Tai was still living, he breathed very deeply. So when he's in the state of um, critical health, he still continues that mindful breathing, very slow, 
deep breathing and very rhythmic breathing. And that's how he sustained his life until now, is just that mindful breathing. And I think that gift of non-fear that they offer to us is um, very precious. Um, last retreat, we have an OI retreat. Uh, no, yes, that, in that OI retreat. And the question and answer session uh, on a Sunday before that, there was a question about um, how to deal with the loss of a mother and how to continue her. And uh, there was a lay person who asked that question and I told him that I will offer this talk today, but I guess he's not here. <laughs> so I hope he's watching online. Um, but I'm sure that this is helpful for all of us. Um, in my own experience, I have not experienced how to um, deal with the loss of my own mother because she's still alive. But I do have the experience of when um, my mother is uh, in ill health and she's near death. I remember um, I was just ordained for a year and I heard the news that my mother had um, a very uh, big brain tumor that has to be hospital, that has to be removed uh, or else she might pass away. So um, I was in France at that time. We didn't have any monastery in U.S. So um, I couldn't fly back right away. I had to book the, the ticket for two days later. And so they told me just to um, use those full two days to practice for my mother, um, to bring my mother with me in everything I do, walking, um, eating, you know, um, praying, touching the earth, everything I do. So um, I did a lot of walking for her, I breathed for her, and the Sangha also chanted for her. And um, I touched the earth, I tried to touch the um, beautiful qualities that are in my mother, but also to touch the um, her witnesses, her struggles, her suffering. And um, I touched very deeply. And then at one point, I felt that my mother become me, <laughs> and that I have her with me, and that um, I didn't have the need to like go to California to see her, because I feel like, okay, if she is going to pass away this moment, I'm ready, because right now she's in me. <laughs> so um, I appreciate Thay's uh, teaching very much, that if we touch deeply our mother in us, then we really don't have to uh, worry that one day she will leave us. So, um, but luckily, you know, when I come home, um, they find out that her tumor has shrink. I don't know if thanks to the prayers of um, Thay and the Plumila Sangha, or in whatever case, but it shrink to a very small size that they just need to give her medicine. And um, she survived, and I was so happy. And she still lives until today. So um, I know that uh, when we touch deeply a mother in us, then um, she becomes one with us. And this is one of the teaching called the Three Dharma Seal. Everything straight today. <laughs> so the first one is um, no self, non self. Non-self means that uh, nothing can exist by itself alone. Um, there is the 
interbeing connection between a mother and us, a father and us, and also the connection between ourselves and our beings and our living beings and everything around us. So this is um, nothing can exist by itself. And the second Dharma seal is uh, impermanence. And impermanence means that nothing can remain um, the same for two consecutive moments. Third Dharma seal is, um, what is it? Nirvana. Nirvana means um, the freedom from all concepts and ideas. Buddhism, we believe that um, the human beings are made of the four elements, the, um, the earth, the air, the water, and the fire. And that these four elements are not only inside, but it's also outside of us. We know that um, the air we breathe comes from the tree, right? The trees, they, they breathe out the oxygen, and then we receive the oxygen, and then we give out the carbon dioxide back to the tree. Um, so there's a cycle of how things are nourishing each other. So we can't not really say that we exist by ourselves. Like, if we don't have the oxygen from the trees, then we would die. But if the trees don't have the carbon dioxide from us, they also die. So things are interrelated. And the water inside of us also relate to the water outside of us. Um, we know that when water are being polluted, then it also um, brings a lot of illness and death to the people who are living in those areas. Like um, in Vietnam, last two years when they have the polluted um, ocean, it caused a lot of suffering to people who live around those areas. And at one point, nobody dared to eat fish or even fish sauce or for the whole year because it's been contaminated. So we know very much that when we take care of um, the water, the air, um, the environment around us, we also take good care of ourselves. Um, actually, there are six elements. Um, if you go further, six elements that compose of the human body, that is also the element of um, consciousness and element of time. I think nowadays, that was 200, uh, 
2,600 years ago in the Buddha time when he, he already see that the humans are composed of those six elements. The um, earth, the water, the air, the fire, um, time and consciousness. But you know now scientists, they have proof that humans are made of the other six kind of elements. Do you know who's the physics major here? Anyone know? <laughs> so we actually made of similar things, which is, you know, Brother Bode? Oh, no, the same Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we are made of also oxygen, which is air, and carbon, and hydrogen, and um, nitrogen, calcium, and phos phosphorus. That's the six major elements. But there are also the five minor elements. But um, we know that when we die, then the nitrogen and the phosphorus and the water, it also go back to the earth and it can nourish the trees again. Um, actually, they say that if we claim that we are vegetarian by just eating plants alone, we are not truly a vegetarian. <laughs> because um, the soil also needs some um, animal flesh in order to have nitrogen and phosphorus and other elements in order to nourish, um, to make the plants and trees healthy. So actually now, some, in some places they have um, tried to promote, but I don't know if it's, if it has, if it had um, spread widely yet, but they're trying to promote the kind of burial that is natural enough, where you just bury somebody under a tree, or you plant a tree on it, and actually nourish those trees instead of bury it in a coffin or, you know, burning it. So, in the old days, I guess when the, in, back in the caveman time when, you know, human beings are just die and we don't have to have all this kind of uh, burial, then I think naturally the human just decay and the plants are feeding on it. Animals are feeding on it. But nowadays we're getting very modern. But I think that to see that, we can see that, you know, we are not separate from things around us and all the plants on all the living beings and non-living beings, they're not um, disconnected from us. Um, and impermanence, impermanence also linked to non-self, because when things are changing, it doesn't have a separate self. So, um, um, can you imagine what it'd be like if things would remain the same forever? <laughs> Like a, a child would just be this size forever and never grow up to be an adult. Or um, a seed never sprout up to be a plant to give flowers and um, fruits to us. So um, we know that thanks to impermanence, things can grow and things can develop, things can change. But sometimes we suffer. Um, because of impermanence, because we might want to hold on to things as they are and not want things to change. So I think that's the major um, problem of of um, of us when we when we think that you know things have to remain the same for forever. <clears throat> so. Um, when we see impermanence in that light, then when a mother is no longer with us, then we also see that she continues and we can continue her. And she is continue in um, many forms. Um, and the third Dharma seal about Nirvana is the freedom from all concepts and ideas. Um, the concepts of birth, of death, of coming, of going, 
of um, different, same, uh, being, non-being, when we are caught in this notion, it makes us not so free. Um, I think we have a lay brother here whose name is uh, Deep Freedom of the Heart. <laughs> um, so when we can be free of all the notions, um, it makes our heart lighter. When we think that uh, our mother is different from us, and we're different from our mother, then we cannot, le- we cannot love her deeply. When we can understand our mother, we can, when we can understand ourselves, then we can love her more deeply. Um, my mother, she went through at least two wars in Vietnam. Uh, the war, the French War, and also the American War, and um, the Vietnam War. And for her, um, being separate from her family, being um, dislocated in different places, um, is a lot of suffering. And uh, I can feel that. And I, I sometimes. Um, receive those suffering from her. I remember when I, I ordained for a few years and at some point I start to feel very sad and I was like crying a lot when I do walking meditation or when I do quiet sitting. And I didn't understand why because growing up I didn't know I have any kind of suffering that I could be aware of. You know, I grew up in America, and I have a good life, so there's no point of suffering. But when I feel this deep suffering coming up, in a strange way, I kind of question them. And the more I practice, the more I see that these suffering are from my mother and my father, and um, they're still in me, you know. Those um, wounds of the war, they still carry it with them and they have not take care of them. So actually when I want to be a nun, one, re- one reason is also to be able to transform the suffering of my ancestors, the suffering of my parents, because I feel that these suf- sufferings have not been acknowledged and transformed. Um, Vietnam, sometimes people try to like push away the past, you know. That's the past, like leave it behind. Don't think about it, don't bring it up. So in my family, um, my parents never brought up anything about the war, any... Sometimes they tell stories here and there, but they never bring up what their actual suffering is. So um, I kind of feel like things are just been buried down there. So I feel that um, I'm here and I'm practicing for them and that can be um, healing. I guess when we heal ourselves, we can also heal our parents. to share with you a little story. Um, Just a few months ago, after um, a retreat, after the orientation talk of one retreat, and it was late at night, so I walked outside the hall here, and the light was kind of dim. We only have some uh, solar light. And I saw something jumping 
you know, right in front of my my feet, and I bent down to look, and I saw a frog, it's like jumping right in front of me, back and forth, and I was curious why that frog is doing that, like keep jumping, you know, in front of me, and so I. I bent down, I sit down, and I look closer, and behind her was this baby frog. <laughs> the baby frog is trying to catch up to his mother, so um, I guess she's trying to bring, them, bring him or her to the pond here, and they were just trying to cross that pavement. And um, so she was, she was trying to protect the baby frog. <laughs> so she trying to like warn me, you know, like, don't step dumb step ahead because we're crossing. So I bent down and I, um, I kind of like acknowledged that. So um, the baby frog saw that and then she began to jump ahead. And then the baby frog kind of like tag along. But the baby frog is very small and it doesn't have that way of jumping yet. So it's jump very in small leap. So I was trying to push it so it can jump. <laughs> so I push it until it jump, and both of them jump to um, near the pond, and then I walked away. But I can see that even um, tiny creatures, they're very smart, and the mother has this capacity of knowing how to protect the young one. So it's amazing that non-self, you know, that um, interbeing nature between um, the mother and the child. Mm. In um, the practice of monastic, we have many gathas uh, to uh, practice when we do uh, our daily chores. And one of it is um, taking a bath gatha. And this gatha relate to um, non-self. So the gatha goes like this unborn and indestructible beyond time and space. Both the transmission and the inheritance lie in the wonderful nature of the Dharma Datu. I think to make it uh, easier to understand, in Vietnamese it means um, there's no birth, there's no death, there's no before, there's no after. And um, both our mother the one who transmit, and also the one who's been transmitted, are both by nature, we are empty. We are empty of a separate self. Um, they say that um, mother and child manifest the same time. Um, and mother and father and child also manifest the same time. So the father wouldn't be called father if he didn't have a child, right? Or a mother wouldn't be called mother if she didn't have a child. So mother and child inter are, and mother ch and child also manifest the same time. Um, in Buddhism, we call the um, causes and conditions. This become like this because that is like that. Um, so, because a mother and us are manifesting the same time, we are in her and she's in us. So, in this moment she's with us, and also in the next moment she will be with us. So we don't need to be afraid that she's not with us, because she's always with us. Um, We don't have to wait until our mother is gone to practice that. If we still have a mother, we can already touch our mother um, right in this moment and to, to um, touch her qualities as well as her um, shortcomings and to help transform them. So, um, Mother's Day is the time to honor our parents, to pay gratitude to our parents and ancestors, is to remember that we have mothers, a mother with us, and um, we also have gratitude to our teachers, friends, and all beings.
the best offering that we can offer to our parents are the material gifts, the spiritual gift, and the gift of non-fear. And when we um, come back to ourselves, when we practice mindfulness, we can be fully present, and we can offer the best uh, to our parents, our children, and our friends. Um, and when we can come back to ourselves, we can also take care of ourselves and then take care of our loved ones. Um, and we can see that there is a very deep connection between ourselves and our parents. And um, we can see that things are changing, but we can accept them because we know that change are for the good thing. And we will no longer be afraid of that. Um, so, um, I'd like to offer a poem to other mothers and also to my mother. Let us um, hear one sound the bell first. So I'll read in Vietnamese first, and I'll read the translation. <coughs> Bài ca cho mẹ, mẹ là tia nắng sớm, sưởi ấm hồn thơ ngay, tình thương mẹ tuôn chảy, mắt rười thoảng mây bay. Như trăng sáng trong ngừng, chiếu rạng suốt đêm khuya, bàn tay mẹ dắt dẫn, ấm lòng hết bâng khuâng. Mẹ còn đó trong con và cỏ cây Mẹ còn trong hơi thở bên con từng phút giây Mẹ là niềm tin mới cho con bước đi lên Vượt qua bao trở ngại gieo hạnh phúc nơi nơi Mẹ ơi con hứa sẽ làm đẹp mẹ trong con Lưu truyền bao thế hệ tình thương lớn vô bờ so in English is um, a song for mother. Mother, you're the morning rays, warming the child's innocent soul. Your love flows gently, cool as a white waves. Like the bright, clear moon shining through the dark night, with your hands guiding me. Sorry. <laughs> Every time I read about mother, I feel very emotional. <laughs> um, <clears throat> With your hands guiding me, I'm no longer afraid. Mother, I know that you're there in me and in nature all around. You are in my every breath. You're in my every step. You're my new faith, moving me forward, clearing the path, and planting seeds of joy in every place. Mother, I promise to continue you beautifully and pass on to many generations your great boundless love. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs>